Well, thank you all for being here. We are really, uh, you know, somewhat surprised by the attendance. Uh, I think we have, I don't know, 60 plus people signed up and a few more people might be, might, you know, might be joining. So it's a Saturday night. I'm sure you would have been, you could have been in a lot of other places. Uh, not really. At least you could have, you know, been binging Tiger King for the third time. So thank you for being here. Uh, as Cameron was mentioning, we had a wonderful uh, boom in the living room earlier. Uh, I followed as much as I can. At one point, six things were going on at the same time. So it felt like the actual boom. Uh, so, uh, you know, we this is our first ever trial in anything online. So we were, we thought we would start kind of small, but again, once, once again, we are so overwhelmed by the response from everyone. Uh, as Cameron said, uh, you're, you all are muted, but your videos are still on in case you're not too familiar with the uh, with Zoom. Uh, you can keep, leave it on or you can turn it off. It's up to you. Uh, but just be aware that uh, if it's on, you know, people might see you. Uh, um, we this is this will be, I would say, one third or maybe a quarter of presentations and two thirds or three quarters conversation. So it's very much a forum. We really need your questions. Um, since it might be a little bit hard, you know, to control when you know, people might speak at the same time, we are requesting you to use the chat uh, to ask your questions. And there'll be a couple of us going through that. We might, because it's a very brief time with, you know, three different artists, we might not be able to get to all the questions, but, uh, but again, uh, feel free to chat, uh, you know, feel free to ask your questions through chat. So, uh, so again, thank you all for being here. I also uh, want to thank our core group of artists, most of whom I see here, uh, all this came together in a few days, uh, especially, you know, Cameron, Kia, Jessica, uh, and a special thanks to Blues, uh, who, who was the host for uh, our Boom in the Living Room. Also a big thanks to uh, some of our biggest supporters, uh, Knight Foundation, the biggest ones being Knight Foundation and Rium Price Fund, uh, without, without whose support over the years, Boom would not have become what it is now. Uh, also to uh, Arts and Science Council, NC Arts Council, WDAV, uh, Blumenthal Performing Arts Center, and a you know, lot of uh, smaller contributors a lot of people who volunteer immense amount of time. So I cannot list everyone, but we are so grateful to all of you. Okay, so we'll get started. Uh, so the format is going to be, we'll have, I'll introduce each of the artists and they will do a small uh, performance or share their work in some way. Uh, that'll be like 10 or 15 minutes and then we'll switch to Q and A. So let me start off, uh, hold on, let me try to share the screen. As you can tell, we all are somewhat new to this. So we will be starting with Frederick Eberhardt. Ever, Eberhardt? Eberhardt, Eberhardt, sorry. Uh, better known as Breeze the Poet. Uh, by the way, all these artists are uh, immensely accomplished. So I'm not even going to attempt to list their all their accomplishments. Uh, you know, you should go to boomcharlotte.org, check out the 2020 artists, and you'll, you'll see way more information about them. You'll also see, uh, you know, the links to their websites, videos, and everything. Um, well, we all are in a big crisis. I did not tell you that. So you know, the arts, arts world especially is. Yes. So we need your support. The artists definitely need your support. So as I introduce, as you can see, we are going to show how you can contribute directly to the artists and of course to Boom. So please do that. Uh, you can do that anytime during this or afterwards, if you know, know the information. We'll also be posting it uh, on, on, on the chat. So, uh, I guess that's about it. Uh, we, we'll get, we'll start with Breeze. You know, he's a, a national, I guess, uh, 
the world uh, slam poetry cha cha uh, champion. So again, immensely accomplished. Uh, his show last year uh, was one of the big hits in like Boom 2019. And, uh, it's great to have him back. So we'll switch over to Breeze. Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone? Um, I am Breeze the Poet. I'm going to be doing a few poems and um, just having a conversation with you all. Welcome to my living room. Um, <laughs> and uh, here we go. <clears throat> she was like, uh, hey, uh, I, got, I got a question. What's the difference between Frederick and Breeze? You know, I never really considered there being a different. <clears throat> well, I would answer you. <laughs> I would answer you, but first, 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 I have to know which, which one of us you, you think you're talking to. Wait, 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 wait. I got a question. I got a question. What's the, what's the difference between a therapist and a nosy person just trying to screw with my fucking head, right? Because you know, because you know you're not a therapist, right? So, so that would make you just a nosy person trying to trying to screw with my. Frederick always gets like this. He takes everything he wants to give people from people. He's like a guard dog who loves to just play fetch. But refuses to let go of the stick or his heart or his demons. I mean, he wants, he wants people to see him. He just doesn't want to feel exposed. He's very abstract art, paints passion with how he loves, but can only picture the pain and broken that loving heart has always left him with. So all you end up with is this beautifully shattered, open wound beating on the canvas of his tuck. I don't really know how to explain it, you know? But um, it does remind me of this this movie I seen one time, yo. So yeah, this movie was oh, okay, okay. You wanna you wanna talk about Breeze? Then I you wanna talk about Breeze, the poet, the poet who puts love in his art. Thinks writing is his heart's form of freedom. Well, that's so stupid. He's not free just because he can cleverly articulate his chains. You know, it's so so stupid. I mean, he takes his shoes off on stage as if the space be safe, be sacred for him. But there's nothing safe about bleeding for pretty for people who aren't gonna help you clean up the mess you make of yourself. I didn't chance to go in, poet, and he never even considered how the fuck you'll get out. I get it though. You know why he's so guarded? You know. I mean, he hates being misunderstood and no one really tries to understand. They just sit comfortable and their assumptions use him as a scapegoat to justify how badly they treat him. I watch him be cautioned, taped into a cage quite often. These days, it just looks like a crime scene. Look at him and can't tell if he's a murder victim or a suicide weapon. All I can tell you is that it's killing a heart and it's so sad because honestly, that's the best part, the movie. Y'all, the movie where the guy kidnaps these girls and he has bald head and um, he has a bunch of unknown personalities living in his unknown, but okay, 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 oh, okay, you wanna, you wanna use Breeze's openness to expose how closed I seem, how let's explore that, shall we? This openness only makes him a target, a gun range, a bullseye, the rifle rhetoric, he doesn't understand love is a fighting word. Why the fuck you think the heart is the size of a fist in the first place? Honestly, he's so weak. I'm tired of him calling me weak. He doesn't understand the strength it takes to hold on to anything. Honestly, he's just a coward who measures his strength on how far he can push people away. Breeze is just a buffet of trauma, offering himself up for everyone to pick through all scars and get full of all faults and leave without ever finishing their plates till all that's left on the table's dirty from the scraps of us. They always leave behind. They always leave us behind. Split. Yeah, Split. That's the name of the movie. I mean, Poem. Anyway, I don't really know how to answer this question. All I can really tell you is if there is such a difference, I hope there's someone out there who can just love, just, just love. All of, all of me. Um, <laughs> That's dope. 
Um, this is crazy experience. Um, this Zoom thing, I'm so used to the energy being different. And <laughs> I see all my hands, that's love. Um, but uh, thank you so much. Um, so me being, uh, huh, I'm sorry, I apologize. My mom is here. <laughs> my mom is here. I didn't know that would happen. That is dope. <laughs> <laughs> my mom is here. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> just had to shout that out. Shout out to my mama. Um, thank you so much, love, for being here. Um, so yeah, okay. yeah. I um. So what do you do with that? Like this dichotomy of having been affected in so many different situations by by just loving. Like, I love love, right? I love to give love. I want somebody to love me so bad, or you know. But then you've been hurt by it so much. That dichotomy is really kind of crazy. You gotta figure out what to do because you're just walking around in a void of not really knowing where that energy should go, how you should express that energy, especially black man with so many negative so many negative directions to put that energy in like i could just out here be i could be a whole hoe out here you know what I'm saying? i just go ahead and be a whole hoe and just be messing over people hearts all over the place i tried that one time though i ain't tried it but i said i wanted to try it i ain't go through with it right and i said i wanted to try it i was talking to my homeboy about it it's like i see Everybody out here just living their best life. They a whole hoe out here and they just loving it, man. Like, how do you not care like that? I'm, a, I'm about to jump on this train right quick, right? And he was like, yo, like, I mean, I feel you, but I just kind of see you keep getting yourself into situations where you turn one night stands into six month mistakes, like all the time. Like, you just can't let it just be what it is <laughs> like if it's just this you know get it popping and get on with your life type of thing you never you hold on to it so i don't really think you got a whole bone in your body bro you got to just deal with that <laughs> and know yourself and i'm like trying to figure out what i'm supposed to do about it and he's like yeah well you should just you know embrace that and understand that it's a bunch of people out here looking for what you got to offer and uh why why would you switch up your stroke if they ain't on your wave and uh, I'm like, wow, like, that's crazy. And I was like, so, so I should love anyway. And he was like, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what you should do. Um, and- All right, all right, Breeze, thank you so much. Um, oh, you just want me to, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that, that was amazing. And- Oh, thank you. Uh, as, this, as it has happened before, I'm so kind of overwhelmed after Breeze's performance, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's so intense, it's so powerful, and you know, you just uh, put yourself out there in a very, uh, yeah, in a, in a extremely moving way. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning of the, in, in the intro, the whole idea of the forum is to uh, see beyond the performance uh, or, you know, see, see, the, uh, see the person and the process behind the performance. So, so. What, you know, based on that, it's a, you know, from what I've seen of your work, it feels like poetry is like a tool of uh, psychoanalysis for you. You're constantly, uh, and you know, again, it's especially with the two poems you sh share right now. I didn't share the other poem. I was about to, but I understand. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, you know, just to keep the time, uh, how long is the poem? We could maybe- could... I, I mean, it's under three minutes. I can say that. Yeah, uh, we, we could definitely do that then. Uh, give me a second. I think there's a couple of questions in the chat, so. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll ask uh, from Elsie. Elsie uh, is asking, Breeze, how did you start and how did you move forward? And, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I, I was thinking of calling on someone in the audience. And don't worry, I won't be doing that with much of you. Uh, 
the godfather of the spoken word, Charlotte Spoken Word scene is with us. Blue. Coach. <laughs> uh, so Bruce has uh, typed in a question. So Bruce, do you want to ask that? You're, you're, you're on mute now. Um, Cause you mentioned that your mother was in the building. Like for us, we know you and your work, but we never really kind of met your family. So my question was, how does it feel to be that vulnerable in, in front of your mother, like to reveal that kind of honesty in the work? I remember the first time I performed and my mom was there and I was legit shook. Like, like uh, I don't know if I can say what I'm finna say, but I'm finna say it. <laughs> um, well, to put it simply, my mama ain't raised no punk, right? So. <laughs> Basically, what had to happen was the conversations that needed to happen. Right. And I was always given the lane to say it, whatever it was. You had to deal with whatever the conversation comes to, you know what I mean? But you got to be grown enough to deal with that conversation. Um, so I was already having those conversations with my mom. Right. Like, a lot of them were unpleasant, unplanned. They weren't, you know what I'm saying? A lot of them were me dealing with my anger in the moment. And my mom having to be like, stand there and look at me like, like I'm snapping, I'm punching walls. I'm all sorts of stuff is going on. And she's just standing there looking at me. So, is, so is this what you're trying to say? Is this, is this, is this what you wanted? Is, okay. So and, and, what about that? I ask, I mean, how old were you? I had that conversation the whole time. I'm snapping. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, when it comes to being able to be that vulnerable in these situations, it's, I, kind of, I was already there, you know? I, I, I came up like that. I came up with the ability to be expressive. Okay. So it wasn't, it's not really hard to, to, you know, I was blessed enough with an understanding enough mother to be able to say, uh, okay, that's what it is. All right, well then let's, let's, let's get to it then. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Uh, we have a question from Cameron, in fact. Uh, so she's asking, what is the start of a poem? Do you begin with an idea or a rhyme or a beat? Um, you said a rhyme or a beat? Yeah, I mean, so um, yeah. How, I begin with the idea. Process? I begin with an idea. Okay. Um, the problem I've been having lately is my idea now has to be attached to a concept. Um, if I, it's harder to write the poem if it is not to me right now, which is something I need to break, but it's harder to write the poem if it's not attached to a concept. Like that poem I just did was attached, the idea was already attached to the concept of writing it as if as the as the movie split right the concept is the movie split the idea is me going through the different identities of me as a person who loves love but has been hurt by love and also the narrator is a whole thing in itself because he's oblivious to everything <laughs> um but yeah so idea then concept my ideas and concepts haven't been on the same, like I get a concept, but I don't have an idea how, of what to, to add it to. Or I get an idea and don't know how to present it. So I just keep missing myself. So I haven't written in a minute, but um, yeah, that's basically the process. Uh, ideas, then write, and then edit, and then try to figure out as you go along what's supposed to, you know, what belongs there and what doesn't, things like that. There's a, okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I was thinking the same too. So Beth is asking, what's the difference between an idea and a concept? I don't well, <laughs> um, the idea is what you want to talk about, the point, the message. Right. The concept is how you present it. Um, okay. um, there's a, a poem I had the privilege of being in um, on final stage of uh, National Poetry Slam in which the concept, the idea was like uh, black death and, 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 and police brutality and, and things like that. Just uh, those were the ideas. 
but the concept is that it was written in a form of a contrapuntal. A contrapuntal is a poem, like if you put, you write two, three poems, you put them side by side. This is a poem, this is a poem. But when you read them like this together, they're a whole different poem. Hmm. And we, we created that concept visually on stage. And um, so that's the, that's the difference. The difference is the, the idea, the message, the point that you want to drive across, and the concept is kind of the vehicle that drives the point home. Right. Wonderful. So, yeah, I wish we could continue talking, but uh, is, are there any other kind of last question? Okay, we got one more. Okay. This is from another friend and colleague of yours. Ah. Number one in the world. I see it. I see it pop up on my. <laughs> what up, number one? Yeah, in the world? Jay Ward. So you, you see the question. <laughs> so I'll just repeat it for everyone. How do you push your art during a time of isolation like this? And uh, excellent question, Jay, because I was uh, about to ask that uh, myself. A time of isolation like this, ah, man, is sheer. First of all, I don't know if I didn't have somebody believing in me. I wouldn't be doing anything. I gotta be honest. Like I myself, I'm so rooted in the idea of being in a venue of energy and people being around the art to inspire the art that I will create. Um, I'm so used to it. I guess you would call a sport. You gotta be very self-motivated in this situation. And if you're not able to just find that motivation or find that energy coming from any from somewhere or from within yourself then you can feel very stuck so right now i just decided to uh because the idea of doing something like this zoom or ig live poetry slams or open mics i was completely against it i, I really was <laughs> i was like no i don't want this i need to hear somebody clap <laughs> I need to hear a cheer. Oh, yeah. Go in, poet. Somebody didn't even say that. I need to feel that energy. And um, so I was against it. But then I start seeing so many people just jump on board and create and keep space open for people to still have reason to create and present. And um, I just hopped into it. And once I hopped into one of them, I just start putting my hands in everything I possibly could. And so now that void is kind of slowly but surely getting filled of, you know, having the motivation or being around the art. I can, you know, see somebody in their living room spitting a poem like I am right now. And I, I can still get that feel, that, 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 that void feel, you know? So I'm using that and involving myself as much as I can. Now I have my own slam that I do on uh, Wednesdays on IG Live. Uh, do, do you want to share your uh, IG so that people can follow? Oh, uh, Instagram is BRZ the poet. It's the same as my cash app. Hint, hint. Same as my cash app. Okay. So BRZ the poet. If you put that in to get to my Instagram, you can put that in to get to my cash app. <laughs> All right. So uh, <laughs> running out of time. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Cameron is also shared. Uh, the thing on the chat, if you if okay. you that, or if you like, cut and paste it. So uh, why don't we close with your uh, other poem? Is that okay with you? Oh, that's fine. Yes. Perfect. Um, thank y'all so much. Uh, what I was saying um, before we got into the questions was that I had this whole dialogue with a friend, and like actual dialogue. We were sitting there playing video games with each other, which. Keep in mind, if y'all want to hear some really introspective things about black men, a lot of those conversations happen during a game of like Madden or 2K or Call of Duty, something like, <laughs> like we have the most introspective conversations playing video games. You would never understand it, but yeah. Um, but yeah, in the midst of having that conversation, um, I came up to the idea of love anyway. And um trying to figure out what that even sounds like, feels like love anyway. It sounds, it's good. It sounds good on like paper or whatever, but like that's a real brave notion, but we know brave and stupid are like the same thing, right? Like bravery is being able to, is going in to do something even though it's dangerous to do. 
And that's the same thing as stupidity. So then now you got to find some fine line between stupid and valiant at, to, to accomplish this emotion. So I figure um, my son Kamari loves, loves hard, loves brave, loves as if he's inapprehensive to the death count in love's name. His love heals all and conquers everything. My son Kamari loves just like his daddy. The true story, one day at his mother's house, he sits on my lap, she walks past playfully, shoves him and he hops up to give chase towards love that he knows loves him back, just like he loves. And I watched him learn what running so freely towards love will do to you if you do not watch where you are going. She reached back and smacked him. Impact incinerated his young innocence. It was a direct hit. You, know, you could look at his face melting like it got hit with a nuclear weapon. You could tell he was too busy loving to know that there was a war going on. And now I am forced to flee from the enchantment of my son's freedom. Be reminded of all the times I thought it was love in the air. How the explosion hit me. How the shrapnel of a broken heart can rip through everything about you, beautiful. And I remember how I loved anyway, how I busted Shanetta out of the city that held her dreams behind bars, but our talks of forever felt to her like confinement because she broke out of us, left me prisoner in my own home and I had to watch her date other men while living with me. I remember it all and how I loved anyway. Like when Tonisha told me that that guy was her aunt's boyfriend, and not hers. And when my ex-wife handed me the phone so I could have a conversation with a guy I was sharing her orgasms with, I remember it all and how I loved anyway. And I just get scared. What am I supposed to teach my son about love? Can't tell him that it conquers all when the only thing it's constantly defeating is me. Can't tell him that it heals all when this open wound of the heart keeps falling into all the wrong salty hands. Can't save him from all the homicidal hands that'll just end up smacking the life out of his ability to love right like his mom did. All I can do is tell my son all I know, which is to love anyway, like your daddy. See all the Heartbroken, I've gone through. I am still here, son, loving hard, and I ain't dead yet. Love anyway, like it has never done anything wrong, because you will never be wrong loving people who do not deserve it. You will never be wrong loving people who do not deserve it. You will never be wrong loving people who do not deserve it. I repeat this like fight song, like anthem until it's etched in my spirit. You will never be wrong loving people who do not deserve it. You will more than likely in your life love people who do not deserve your love. Love, but you will never be wrong loving people who do not deserve it. You will only be wrong to stop loving when you yourself are so deserving of love. What I will tell my son of love, be love anyway. Be a hero. Be a purple-hearted kind of honor that leaves no love lost or left behind because if you are not fighting for love, then you are only fighting against it. And I simply refuse to raise you to become somebody else's war. Thank you. <sighs> these hands is crazy. I like these. <laughs> these hands going is crazy. <laughs> oh man, thank y'all so much. Okay, so it looks like I've been unmuted. So, uh, thank you, Breeze. Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit overwhelmed even to talk. No, that is that is more than amazing. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's you know, it's after these kind of performances, you know, every time I feel like this is why we do boom, seeing the uh, seeing all the artists like you know really put everything. Uh, 
of themselves out there. And I think we cannot find a better example than that. So uh, hopefully you can see the screen. Uh, thanks again to the great Breeze, the poet. Uh, you can see how you can uh, support him. Uh, by the way, if you have more questions for Breeze, uh, at, there will be this round table of, you know, at the end. So you can, you know, you can still ask, ask it to him. So we are moving on to the next artist, uh, Sarah Council. Uh, some of you might have seen the amazing piece she did uh, last year, Boom 2019, uh, at Petras, where she used all the four spaces. Uh, first time somebody's using, uh, doing that. So you know, the uh, audience follow around uh, you know, into you know, the, the four different spaces. So, so if Breeze's poetry, again, I am, uh, hugely overgeneralizing something which is really vast and uh, hard to describe, but if Reese's poetry is uh, about uh, exploring, you know, the, the kind of the deep processes of one's own mind and uh, uh, character and this very deep ideas like love, uh, Sarah's is that, but uh, her recent work has also been an exploration of the body, the human body, as we grow, as we age, uh, as we go through all these transformations. So like maybe a tree putting out those rings, uh, showing its growth and its history, the impact that the passage of time leaves on the body and how to unlock it through movement. And uh, so kind of reflecting back to the world, uh, all that. Uh, I hope I, it was uh, not too bad an intro. So uh, let me, uh, let's switch over to Sarah Council. Hi, <laughs> I'm Sarah. Um, that was a great intro, actually. Thank you, Manoj. And oh my gosh, Reese, that was amazing. And how hard to follow such a passionate and beautiful performance. Um, but like Manoj said, um, I, um, I'm a choreographer and um, I like to think about myself as a collector and sort of the first part of my um, creative process as the process of collection. And what I mean by that is um, kind of going through our day and you're collecting images and words and ideas and interactions and all those things eventually sort of come out in an idea or thread of a concept of a piece uh, for me. And sometimes that's sort of an intimate focus um, with relationships and, and dynamics within relationships and expressed in solos and duets and smaller works. And other times I have opportunity to uh, take a wider scope and, and really look at societal issues and things like that and the piece that Manoj was talking about, I um, uh, collaborated with Alexandra Warren and we um, kind of pulled two existing pieces apart, put them back together and then made them site adaptive within Petra's Bar and it was such a, an exciting experience and um, I really am thankful for the opportunity that, that Boom allowed me to take that risk with the absolute possibility of failure, <laughs> um, but it also was a really um, an opportunity for growth. And uh, the, where, what I'm worried about now with my creative process, I really um, am looking to have more questions than answers when I go into the studio. Um, I really want to create space to listen to the body and to um, honor the wisdom that the body has and, and know that uh, if I make this space and if I try to listen, that what, what I hear and what is created will have inherent meaning. Um, and th the solo that you're about to see is a small section of a larger piece called A History of Dirt. And in that piece, we really looked at um, how a body is a keeper of history and a record of the things that we've done, things that have been done to us. And um, even thinking about that we exist in a web of histories of our body, our family, our city, our country, and how all of these things affect us, whether we, we realize it or not. And the solo um, that Sam is going to do for us today from the uh, an intimate version from her living room, um, it actually existed about a year before a history of dirt was created. And it was um, a project with a friend who gave several choreographers a word, or we were able to choose a word and then to create a work around that. And the word that I chose was Kinsakori, and I may be pronouncing it wrong, but that um, 
refers to a Japanese um, method of mending broken pottery by using gold leaf. And so the result is a beautiful vessel that has all these golden veins in it. Um, and from a philosophical point of view, it's the concept of our history matters and the wounds that happen to us matter and we're more beautiful for having been broken. Um, and so that kind of was the beginning of that idea of thinking about how the body holds so much meaning and emotional history. And then that was further sort of developed into a history of dirt. Um, so again, uh, Sam Salvato is going to be performing this excerpt of A History of Dirt, and the music um, was created by Michael Wall, and you can go to his website, soundformovement.com, and see more of his work.
Thank you. Okay. W sorry, I was waiting for Cameron to unmute me. That's okay. Yeah, we're still, you know, <laughs> new technology. We are not that quick quick with it yet. So, uh, you know, we are getting some comments and questions. Uh, one quick thing I want to uh, tell the three artists is that I see Janelle uh, had commented about this, about breezes. Uh, so uh, in the last part, the discussion, the, the round table, if you will, uh, it'll be good if, you know, all of you can also talk about, you know, what about the each other's work really, you know, resonated with you or if you have any questions for each other. So, uh, so I'm not going to repeat those comments right now. So to start with a, maybe a, a rather very silly question, but uh, well, wonderful performance, Sam. Thank you. Uh, how would this performance have been different if it, it wasn't in Sam's living room and if it was on a stage or a dance floor? That's really interesting. Uh, well, we definitely, we use the space differently. You know, she uses the space in a more full kind of way when she's able. Um, but I have to say that when we sat down and had our Zoom rehearsal and started to play with this form, it was really interesting how to uh, play with the foreground and background and bringing her into the camera a little closer and offering maybe a view and an intimacy that you might not have if you were in a theater space. And that, in fact, was one of the things that was so fun about being in Petra's was the audience was really in the space with us. And that solo was at the very end of the piece that ended up, uh, that ended up being uh, finished by the audience members joining the dancers and sort of doing this slow dance motif, motif that had been uh, in the piece. But um, so I think that while we, in a traditional space, you'd have a lot more space to, to move you know, um, throughout. I've enjoyed playing with the intimacy that this sort of form, even though we're isolated, the intimacy that uh, this form can can bring. It's interesting. Wonderful. Uh, by the way, whenever you look at the chat, there are so many compliments uh, you guys have been receiving. So I'm not going to read the, all that out. And uh, also, you know, we, we have some very, a uh, uh, lot of very accomplished artists and, you know, movers and shakers of the art world. Uh, mostly local joined us, so uh, thank you all for being here. So, uh, I mean, I think Elsie has a question, uh, another dancer choreographer in town, hopefully you saw her performance earlier today. So I think it kind of, it's a good continuation of this. this. So she's asking, this platform has given, a, given another layer to it. The screen has allowed to see the facial expressions and the going in and out of screen at, at the end. The question is, how, how does it add another layer for you as a choreographer? I think um, kind of similar to what I, I have, um, mentioned earlier that I really love being able to get that inside look where you can't necessarily get that in a, definitely in a proscenium situation where you're sitting away from the stage. But even in an intimate uh, venue, it's hard to get that close. Um, and feel maybe even comfortable, you know, uh, to be that close. And um, it's also something that I've been thinking about. I don't know anything about dance film, but I have ever since Petra's, again, and just having that intimacy um, with the audience, I've really been interested in maybe pursuing looking into that because of that aspect, that you get these views and these sort of bird's eye views that you just can't get uh, sitting in a theater necessarily. So. Um, I'm really curious about that and like looking deeper into how to play with, with that. Yeah, you know, I've been wondering, you know, this you know, forced confinement and isolation, how it's going to affect uh, the artist's work. And it looks like it's you know, yeah. you're already starting to see that. Uh, you're, yeah. uh, you know, being on a big stage or you know, even, even on an intimate setting is even, this is in a, in a lot of ways even more intimate. You know. Yeah. It is, and in your home too. <laughs> 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 things about it that feel really intimate in a strange way. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, 
So interestingly, I think we have more people now than we could have had at Petras. Yeah. <laughs> Now, just so, like Elsie said, next time we have to get everybody moving together too. That's the added, right. <laughs> added layer. <laughs> right. Uh, so, uh, Kelly Ferguson. Hey, Kelly. Uh, Kelly or Kaylee? I should have, I should know this now. I've known you for years, but uh, a great question from her. So, the looking into the camera really got me. I would also like to know about your choice of movement, music, and physical language especially as an untrained dancer and non-choreographer? So, um, yeah, the, um, the physical language and movement, I think, develops within each piece that's created and it's sort of a vocabulary that over time um, is expanded upon and um, then finally kind of distilled to decide what each piece needs. But each, each uh, idea and each piece sort of becomes its own world and with, uh, together with the um, dancers a uh, vocabulary is developed um, and like I said early in the intro that I really am trying to uh, take a more sort of introspective approach and in how that vocabulary is developed and sort of an inside out idea or somatic maybe idea um, rather than um, you know, well, how does this look and kind of taking from the outside in. Um, I'm mm -hmm. trying to really listen to what the body wants to say. Um, and uh, yeah, so and, and with that particular piece, I think also the image of the Kensakuri and the veins and the idea of, of um, the body ha holding this, this information um, and really thinking about uh, that was part of how the movement was developed. The music so, oftentimes, yeah. to be honest, I don't usually start with music. Music is usually comes somewhere in the middle of the piece. Um, this piece of music was already or already composed, but oftentimes I work with the composer and um, we'll kind of go back and forth as we, as the piece is made, but I don't, I don't mm. hardly ever have music at the beginning. It mm. kind of comes halfway through usually. So, so you know we're set to dance to a existing tune. It's been done, but it's not okay. really uh, my instinct. However, I was right. talking to my husband recently that maybe that would be another good challenge to try to try that process since I haven't done it in so long in that way. Right. But um, yeah. <laughs> so I think you uh, touched upon some of this in the current times, like what you just said, but uh, Laura Powers is asking, speak into how the movements convey your idea. Um, well, with that piece, um, we were thinking a lot about um, sort of memory and seeing in, like in particular when that piece was first made of the dancer that I made it with, we had the Kinsakori idea of a hist of the idea of history um, and the wounds that we, we sort of collect over time. But also she and I had both had experienced, this is a, this is intimate, but <laughs> a loss in our life. And so I think we were also thinking a lot about how um, about thinking about the losing someone and and you know maybe seeing them, but um, it's not them, but it's the memory that you have, and then realize you know over time realizing that they're in they're with you, you carry them with you, and so I think that that thread sort of was part of how that piece was made. And again, there's so many things that go into creating a dance, and I don't necessarily make things to be understood in a sort of narrative linear. I really am looking or working with images and emotion and sort of more abstract ideas. And so I wanna give absolute license to anyone viewing that anything you see and think and feel is the right thing for you to see and think and feel. <laughs> so um, it's a very broad uh, um, invitation and it's exciting to me that what I you know, have gone through and, and bringing to the table meshes with what you have gone through and are bringing to the table. And somehow that meeting of that meeting space is what is really exciting to me as a choreographer. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so Trey McGriff, hey Trey, uh, is asking, does any of your work lend itself to impro let's, no, sorry, no, no, lend itself to improvisation? And I think, again, I think you, just upon some of that and kind of related to that, I was also wondering that how this piece has changed because it was originally performed by a different dancer, so. Yeah, it's it been performed by three when... different dancers now. <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. And uh, I think each time it does change, you know, and it becomes 
um, we work, and maybe Sam can speak to this too, or the process. Um, you know, it has a skeleton of a, a piece, but it's sort of fleshed out by each dancer that brings themselves to the process and their own experience. Just like that meeting space I was talking about of the artist and the audience, that same thing exists between the artist and the collaborating artists in the project. So um, it's been really cool to see how different it really is, uh, has changed uh, with each different voice, but in my opinion, like beautiful in each iteration, just, um, uh, yeah. So, um, and with the improvisation, um, a lot of times the early work starts with some improvisational ideas that then get fleshed out into more set things. But that's another thing that I am really interested in pursuing um, in some of the next pieces I'm making. It's like some more structured improvisational moments within the set choreography and sort of challenging myself in that way. Wonderful. Uh, Jay Ward is asking me, asking you, uh, what, are, what have you found yourself most inspired by lately? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, right, uh, absolutely, by right, during this isolation time, um, there's been, and I've heard someone calling it the democratization of dance where like there's access to just everything right now. And so I'm taking classes with choreographers in New York that I used to take class with and haven't in a long time and other people that have just been really inspired by their work and now I'm getting to, you know, take their class and, and learn about their process. And then there's lots of places to watch dance that are have become available. So I feel like when I can, you know, uh, kind of get myself out of my homeschooling, <laughs> I'm also an eight-year-old, <laughs> uh, crazy funk, and actually do the thing and take advantage of all these things. There's a lot of opportunities right now, in fact, to be inspired and um, yeah, just a lot of open space for that. So that's been exciting. So it's great you mentioned your eight-year-old because the next question is from Charles Council. Who that's my husband. <laughs> you know a Eli, Sarah's Hi, -old. <laughs> eight -old wants to know, how do you get dancers to cooperate and work as a team to make, <laughs> make awesome dances? Well, luckily, everybody that, you know, steps through the door is doing it because they love it. Because as we all know, there's not a lot of money for especially contemporary modern dance. <laughs> so anyone that's there is there because they want to be there. And then that's... Um, that's awesome. You know, we all share that together. And um, I often think it's such a privilege to uh, be in the space, hopefully again sometime, and do the work that we do and spend that time to quiet ourselves and be in the present moment and connect to body and connect with each other. And that's, that's unique and it's beautiful. And I'm so thankful to them um, to take the time to do that and uh, just to be able to continue to pursue that. Um, I think it's shared passion, <laughs> but isn't money. Uh, so uh, actually, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll leave some time for some final comments for you and Sam. Uh, I think Sam wants to say something, but <laughs> let me do with one more, one last question. And like I said to everyone, uh, if you have more questions for any of the artists, hold it till the end. We'll have more time for that at the end uh, when you have the round table. So Kevin Patterson is asking, when you deal with different dancers, do you give them some major note for the major character to come through? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. And every dancer um, approaches things differently and um, uh, sort of, I think that's part of my job too, is to know what their strengths are and how they um, sort of learn you know some people want lots of detail right away other people need to move through material for a while before giving lots of detail work um, they're ready for that and so learning those things uh, is important um, and I think uh, with this particular solo and having three different dancers do it learn me learning um, about each dancer and uh, watching them do the material helps to shape sort of the focus that it will have um, based on their strengths. Does that answer my question? I guess so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sam might be able to yeah, talk to that too. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah it looks like, yes, yeah, Sam, are you, uh, hopefully you're unmuted. Okay, yeah. Sam, uh, do, you, do you have any comments, thoughts, questions? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, for that last question, um, I knew the dancer who did this um, solo before I did, and I think we right. moved very differently. So at first, I was trying to, oh. um, like, I knew she did all this stuff so well, and I just wanted to do it like her. But once Sarah told me the like meaning behind the piece, and then I got to understand it for myself, it didn't matter um, to match her like positions correctly as long as I was moving with the story and the intention behind all of the movement. That's what. Um, what the piece really means. So as far as that one question goes, yeah. And I also wanted to say earlier, as far as collaboration goes, Sarah is a wonderful choreographer to feel like you're in this space with her. She really values her dancers. And a lot of, um, we start off with a lot of imp <laughs> improvisation together. And that often leads to um, choreography that she then builds off of. So it is a really collaborative process. So I feel like I'm in the work and she knows that too. So it's a it's a great process to be with. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Simon. It was an amazing performance. Uh, <laughs> Sarah, do, do you have any final thoughts or comments? Um, no, I was just thank you for in, uh, including us in this, and um, I really enjoyed uh, being part of it. It's exciting, exciting to explore this new space. Yeah. So, uh, going to switch. Uh, hold on. So what, yeah, uh, look back to Sarah's information and uh, thank you again, Sarah, uh, yeah. for talking more in half an hour. So our last and third, uh, artist, third and last artist for the night, uh, Janelle Dunlap. Uh, so if, uh, I, I would say it's if uh, Breeze's and Sarah's work is, I would say more intro, uh, introspective and, you know, kind of process for digging into oneself, kind of critiquing your uh, psyche and your body. Uh, Janelle's kind of work, again, I'm over uh, generalizing, oversimplifying a great body of work. Uh, it's more of a critique or, you know, an inquiry into the, uh, the structure, how the society works, how it, you know, uh, what is what's on identity within that. Uh, so, well, I, I think I should just let Janelle start and then you know, we can, she'll be far better, uh, she'll be able to explain all this far better. Okay, here you go, Janelle. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Manoj. Um, again, this is also new for me. Um, so <laughs> my, um, as, as you all know, my name is Janelle. I'm a mixed media social practice artist. Um, so what that means is that I typically, um, like I, I gain a lot of inspiration by watching society and observing society. Um, I think that typically, especially as artists nowadays, we are called to respond immediately when things happen. Um, and for me, it does take some time to be introspective and reflect on experiences um, that involve other people um, so that I can make sense of it. Um, so the, um, the performance piece that I would have shared with um, Charlotte Boom in person is called Identity Work 2. So I'm doing a series of um, reflective pieces that require uh, members of society to essentially think about our collective behavior. Um, and with this last installation, or this installation, um, I am observing how we um, how, how we perceive how we perceive the act of protest, um, and I am doing that with the um, through the guise of performance and visual art. Um, so I'll start by I guess sharing some video. Um, I'll share my screen, and I'll speak over it. Um, so if there's any questions, again share them in the chat. That Cameron or whoever's um, who else is also working with tech, just help me through this. I know we've done this before, um, but I want to. Um, let me see. Okay. So give me a second because I need to share my screen. Great. And we are going to share iMovie. And I am going to go here and we're going to play full screen. Great. So I'll start by saying that um, my, my creative career, um, which has taken different directions now, um, better directions, really started at Charlotte Boom. 
Uh, this is 2017 and I was um, installing the Queens Cuffs Community Vision Board. So I, I, I collected several visions or several um, images from the, um, from the discussion on gentrification in 2017 and affordable housing and um, aligned a lot of that narrative with um, urban renewal and displacement uh, from the 60s and 70s. Um, and I was a, a lot applying a, at this moment, I was applying a um, digital sketch of the outline of the skyline of the city um, that I created with vinyl print. And um, I was gonna, I spray paid this, uh, the skyline gold uh, to kind of reflect that, hey, what, what's going on behind this shiny skyline is actually like the real narrative of the city. Um, but yeah, so I'm really appreciative of Boom and everything that you guys have done to like just provide platforms because, you know, this was like, this is some renegade stuff. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just experimenting. So um, I've, I've able to like go much farther since then. So I've been collecting um, video and uh, documentation on protests specifically after the Charlotte uh, uprising in 2016 in response to the um, Keith Lamont Scott and uh, Justin Carr shootings or, or police shootings. So um, I, I wanted to, to also compare and contrast this experience of humanity to uh, what's also going on across the world. I was really intrigued by the fact that um, Hong Kong was also experiencing something similar. Uh, there are several facets of their democracy that are changing. And uh, they're also, or they were at the time before uh, COVID-19, they were protesting and people were taken to the streets, but also people were having to conceal their identity because to reveal your identity and this act of protest meant a mark against your character or um, a mark against your social credit, um, in which China has uh, enacted a social credit score that <laughs> things like protests might appear or come off as um, not being a good citizen. So this could bar you from certain mainstream uh, rights or civil rights um, and civil liberties in the future. So um, I was inspired to kind of take this active protest and, and see if protests could somewhat be protected if we aligned it with performance art. Um, so Re this is Reba Bowens and Stephen Dannon. Uh, this is um, imagery or footage from Time Camp 002 at Goodyear Arts in 2018. Um, and they are, are doing a piece on time, but I, I specifically identify Reba Bowens because um, we've developed this creative relationship over the past couple of years uh, to, to participate in this. And I'll speak more on Reba in just a second. View, um, presentation, present, great. Hold on. <laughs> so I guess I'll, I'll come back to the screen towards me because that's what my uh, laptop just did. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm exploring. Can you guys still see my screen or no? You can't? No, you, we are seeing you. So yeah. You see me? Okay. Okay. Great. Share screen again. Okay, great. I'll, we'll do that. Um, great. All right. Share. So this is Reba Bowens. Um, she is a contemporary modern art, um, a contemporary modern dancer. And um, I was really interested to see, could we reenact the, the act of protest through modern dance, modern contemporary dance? And does that somehow protect it? Does that somehow allow us to go to the streets or take to the streets and be in and, and protest and not be considered thugs or not be considered dangerous? or um, contrary to what mainstream society might deem us as. So um, I've also been uh, looking into concepts of protest in the past and what, was, what were the visual aesthetics of protest then and how do I apply them to more modern day context now? Um, how do I take the, um, essentially the armor that people use against protesters and, and reaffirm protesting as an act of um, civil liberties and a civil, and the civil right. So what I came up with is, uh, so this is a uh, sample piece that I've created 
um, using a natural police shield. Um, and this, uh, I also should note that like, this is a project that um, I found support with through the cultural arts or cultural vision arts grant through Arts and Science Council. And um, the, the whole concept is to like reposition the narrative of protesting um, and give people or give the artists the armor to experience what it might feel to be protected on the other side of that shield uh, through the act of protest, but through modern contemporary dance. So taking this into like modern day context, a lot of, I guess what I think about this performing, about this performance and this visual presentation has changed because protesting has changed. Uh, the whole concept of um, what civil liberties are and um, even the act of protest is shifting as we, as I, as I speak. Um, and this is an image uh, taken just a few days ago. I know that um, New York Times had posted this image, uh, but essentially of people um, going to uh, city hall or, or like other local government agencies and demanding that the city reopen up, that local economy, economies open back up, that we essentially kind of <laughs> ignore the existence of COVID-19 and what it might do to um, the, the health, the public health of society um, to support the, um, uh, to support essentially the economy. Um, so I am going to stop sharing. Yay, pause, pause share, great, okay. <laughs> and then, um, or stop share, great. Um, but yeah, so as a visual artist, it's kind of hard for me to like give you everything um, but this is essentially what identity work part two um, is about. It will still be shown, it will still be presented. Uh, but I, I again thank Boone for allowing me the opportunity to kind of always provide the space to experiment and to question things. Um, and as I said before, you know, I'm not the kind of visual artist that responds to something immediately after it happens. Sometimes it takes me years to process. I was a part of those. Um, protesters during the 2016 um, Charlotte uprising. And at the time I was working in um, the, I was working in strictly in the nonprofit industry. And I remember overhearing coworkers refer to protesters as, as, as unemployed thugs. Um, even though I've been out in the streets with, with the protesters to 2 a.m. in the morning um, with colleagues who had worked in the school system with me, social workers, teachers, other nonprofit workers. Um, and it, that experience was a bit traumatizing for me. So I've been thinking about uh, what ways do we, we think about protesting in um, this new digital age, this new age where um, being, being together in public is seen as, as dangerous or an act of disobedience. So although I have um, created this piece, now I'm rethinking how this should exist in space and how um, the performance, the, the dance performance should be presented as well. So I'm glad to have the opportunity to like cool a lot of other things down. You know, uh, my life was really about to go fast forward <laughs> until like August. Um, I was supposed to be in Senegal like a month from now for like uh, two oh, weeks. Gosh. Yeah, so, <laughs> but again, like I'm really taking this opportunity to reflect and like to re-examine uh, the works that I've created. And I understand there are two grad programs you are about just about to start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, two um, MFA programs. Um, I'm um, recently um, was accepted and um, supported, fully supported through the School of the Arts Institute of Chicago through the low residency program. And um, I'm also in the MFA program at Prescott College um, that Patrice Colors, who's the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, um, founded, uh, which is really helping me keep the radical end of the art that I, I, I love. Um, and it's really also helping me dive into the social practice element of my art. Well, congrats, it's, it's you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it all started with Boom, though. It all started with Boom, so oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, very thankful. And uh, for full disclosure, you know, I've known Janelle for a while. We we have had several wonderful conversations. So we uh, have the same birthday. That, that's true. We, we are yeah. twins. Actually, she's older. Might not look that way, but. <laughs> <laughs>
so, you know, unlike a lot of artists at the core of Boo, uh, you don't have a BFA. Your background is not uh, in contemporary art. So at what, uh, at what point in li your life or, at, you know, what kind of was a trigger for you to take up art as the, the means to address societal issues? Because I know that, you know, you've done education work, I guess, uh, social, not a social work, not, not nonprofit work. Mm -hmm. so, you know, what provoked your, or what inspired your uh, transition into art? Uh, to be completely honest, it was, it was Capoeira. Um, so I know River oh, Bones through Capoeira, um, and Capoeira is an Afro-Brazilian martial art that um, is a fight disguised as a dance. Right. And when I recognized that Capoeira, Capoeira was essentially an art protest, um, I think that really opened up my mind to what art could look like. And um, it, I've, I've been doing Capoeira since 2015. Um, I think fall of 2014, I was tiptoeing in it, but I really committed to myself to it in uh, 2015. And that's that's what did it. Uh, just exploring and experiencing and being able to connect with an art that um, is from the African diaspora. Um, and then from there, learn so many different cultures, learn so many different people and really be embraced by international community. So it was, it was, the, it was doing Capoeira just for my own personal health that opened up my world to art. Right, right. but and also, you know, I feel like you are kind of, you know, as you and I have talked about before, the whole idea of social practice. So, you know, I think we are at also at a time where uh, the whole uh, definition of art is shifting. And I feel like you are you are kind of at the right place at the right time, because I think the world is suddenly very, receptive to the kind of art you want to do or your approach to art. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to be honest. Like when I first started, when I was at Boom, I really didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, <laughs> I mean, like I had a vision, but as far as like the application of it, man, it's, I swear it's taking me years to understand how to take something from vision to like actual physical space and reality. Um, right. And all this time, um, I really think that, like, for the most part, I've been screwing up. I've been failing, <laughs> not intentionally, but just because out of out of pure just curiosity, I needed to understand how to move through art and how to like create. Um, and you know, it wasn't until I got that acceptance letter from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago that it kind of dawned on me that maybe I've been doing right by failing. It didn't always have to be perfect. It didn't always have to be right. Um, and put the cherry on top of that, like it was a full scholarship. So that's how I knew yeah. that all of the failing was worth it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, let, moving to a couple of questions. Uh, the camera is asking, how do you envision the different genres collaborating or how have they existed together in the past? Or I think it's a, uh, Different genres. Yeah. Um, well, I've I've never been someone who's strictly like one medium. I do paint, um, but I don't believe in existing strictly in like one medium of creation. Um, so I'm really also interested in sound art and taking audio clips and like emerging them with other things. But uh, I think again, like Capoeira opened my mind up to like understanding that art can exist anywhere. I mean. Capoeira is a martial art, but when you actually experience it in person, like it really is an art form. You have a band or you have people actually playing music. You have specific movements and rhythms for different moods. And um, so I think just having the exposure to an art like Capoeira let me know that I can experiment with different mediums. I didn't have to stay in one lane. Yeah, it's fascinating, you know, I mean, I think I guess one of the things about social practice is that artists are going from somebody who made things to me, somebody who makes things happen, I'm quoting Natalie Jeremichenko there. And so it looks like your role also has been more of an orchestrator who can bring together people from different mediums and string it all together. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I've, 
I, I'm definitely, you know, I, I'm more than well aware that I am not capable of doing everything that my mind conceives. And this is right. why I, I oftentimes pull in collaborators to help visualize, to help create the physical presence of the things that I see in my mind. Um, right. I don't know if like you're, you know, you're familiar, if people are familiar with uh, Sloan Siobhan and Georgie Nakima or Garden mm -hmm. of Journey, but these are people who I've worked with in the past, even Marcus Kaiser to, um, because I understand that I might not have the skills, but I know people who have the skills and who can help articulate my vision better for me. And so like I've leaned on those people um, to help create, you know, public art visions that um, when I tried to talk about Afrofuturism to, you know, like traditionalist or people who aren't really familiar with contemporary art, it doesn't make sense coming out of my mouth, but when I use them as a reference and they see the history of their work, now they understand and, and they are more willing to come and meet me in the middle and experiment with something. Um, and I guess the, the, the most recent example of that would be Reclaim 37, which is in the library of Johnson C. Smith University, and which is another example of like an area that I feel like I failed in in the past, but it's actually become something like as time goes by and like as I've developed more knowledge as an artist and as a curator, like I've, I've been able to cultivate these spaces to be what I actually envision them to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's been just a series of experimentation of failing and then suddenly realizing that you were actually succeeding the entire time. It's a crazy concept. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're, you're kind of running out of time, but a couple of quick questions. So uh, Kaylee Ferguson is asking, uh, oh no, I, I think I scrolled past it. Uh, okay, uh, amazing work, Janelle. Hard to, ha hard to see or relive the footage, uh, but very necessary, especially from a black young woman's perspective and for archiving in these digital times. Thank you. Uh, I, I assume Kelly is referring to the uh, uprising footage that you showed. Uh, yeah. Among others. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you for that response. Hold on, let me see what's going Kevin Patterson is saying, thank you, Janelle. You gave me a lot to think about. I'm a writer and many of my friends are writers. So something we have discussed is when we come out of this, if you write something in, mo something in uh, modern times, you will have to make reference to what we are going through. But how do you write something about afterwards when you are in the middle of it? Hmm. How do you write something when you're in the middle of it? Yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not really clear about the question myself. Well, yeah, I, I think that's <laughs> why. If you want to clarify a little bit, it's just a, it's just a long paragraph. Okay, okay. He's a writer. Gotcha. No, I mean, but I think that's why it was so important that I sat on the emotions and feelings that I felt about the protest four years ago. Um, and waited to a time where I felt like maybe it wasn't relevant in the current moment, but in the coming months, it could be relevant again, because the face of the protesting of the protester is changing or it has changed, and especially if you put it into modern day or like present day context. Um, so it's I, I journal a lot. I re read back my, my journals from the past. And uh, that's where I find my motivation or my inspiration to create things to like speak on what's happening now. Um, so it's, it's very valuable, yes, to like, you know, to look on things from the past to inform what you want to do or how you want to present them in the future. Um, and I, I guess I cannot really explain any other way that, that that's my process. Yeah, so I, would you say that writing things down or, you know, kind of forcing yourself to, uh, kind of organize your thoughts through writing, it, does that become the way for you to? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's the first way, like that's the first right. step, it's like to right. write it down. Right. Uh, well, uh, I think, let me see. So there's a general question here. Uh, what, so, what social practice in particular informs your work? Uh, Okay, um, with social practice, so socially engaged art, I think is the, um, maybe the first one, because 
when I showed you the video of my first um, two thousand, my first boom installation where I was installing that vinyl print of the skyline, um, it wasn't just me creating that. I had people from the boom audience like apply those articles onto this four by twelve piece of plywood. Um, so I think as Breeze was saying earlier, it's like it's, it's harder to like create when you're not absorbing energy from other people. Uh, but socially engaged art is, has been really my favorite way of going about it because I, I, I feel like that people can only absorb art and retain the memory of what I'm trying to convey if they participate in it. Right. By the way, just Beth uh, from Atlanta who asked that question. Uh, so, uh, you know, you said it took you, what, like three or four years to be able to express the the emotions, I mean, and you know, we're all going through a very tough time during the uh, uprising. So, you know, the other side of social practice where, you know, artists are kind of expected to respond to current issues through their art. Whereas, you know, before that, you know, artists had that uh, agency to turn away from it all. It's, it's a personal expression all that. Do you think it's more of a pressure, you feel more of a pressure that, you know, uh, internally or externally that you need to respond if something is going on? I think it depends on the kind of, I guess, artist you are. Um, so I, I love that, like, I kind of figured out how to, I guess, manage a lifestyle where I'm just really, I'm floating in between residencies and fellowships and opportunities that give me time to process things. Um, but if you're someone like who's more of a commission based artist, um, you, I do understand that like your response might need to be quicker. Um, and right. also your skill set's gonna be different. So, um, or may or may not be, but that's what I've observed. Um, so I'm, I'm not necessarily in the mindset where I feel like I have to respond immediately again, because I understand like it takes time to process these things, but also being that August is a potentially gonna be a big time for Charlotte and the issue of protests will reemerge. So um, what better time to like prepare ourselves mentally than to like right. analyze how we can approach protesting in this new era. Yeah, it's so, so timely. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, protests could, might remain, remain timely for the near, you know, uh, as far as we can see in the near future. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let me see if there are any more questions. Uh, is there any, any final comment or uh, remark you want to make before we move on to the discussion? For me? Yeah. Oh, okay, no. I, I, think, um, I think we, I, I might have missed some questions, but as I was saying earlier, please, uh, if you don't mind, uh, repeat it while we're doing the uh, uh, panel discussion. So you, you still have time to talk about that. So, uh, okay. Senor. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, thank you, Janelle. Let me put you back up there. So this is how you can support Janelle, uh, especially as she's you know, uh, going on to big things very soon. And uh, I personally am very, uh, really looking forward to see how you're, you know, having followed your work the last few years, uh, uh, just to see how it uh, develops and evolves in the uh, coming years. So. Okay. Thank you, Manoj. Again, yeah. I, I, it's, you know, it, Boom was really what gave me my first platform. And um, it's opportunities like this that um, inspire artists to keep creating. So thank you. Yeah, and, and, uh, and I have to say that, you know, uh, as somebody who's been in the, in the art scene longer than, uh, way longer than you in, in Charlotte, uh, you know, it's a very, a very conventional city when it comes to art, but uh, I think First of all, you have really broadened people's perception of what art is, uh, you know, from just being a beautiful object or a performance into something more of a process, something which involves a community, uh, something which, you know, kind of addresses kind of common things or you know, the, the whole thing about social practice. So uh, it's been wonderful. And also it's been great to see the city embrace, you know, all your new ideas. Uh, I know you work with so many organizations you some are, or you know, you kind of co-curated a residency at the McCall Center. So uh, 
anyway, it's been it's been very impressive. What, what all we you've been able to achieve, even though uh, from your own perspective, you might have think of a lot of what you do as failure. Uh, it's interesting how you know how an artist look at their own work and how everyone else sees it. Yeah, this is true. We're all our own self critic, our own yeah. work self critic. Yeah. And which I think it's also important. Uh, so uh, again, thanks again, Janelle. So uh, we are uh, about to bring everyone back in. So welcome back, Breeze and Sarah. Uh, by the way, I, you know, I, I just realized that I didn't introduce myself at the beginning. So you know, I'm the founder of the organization which runs Boom. Uh, my background is you know, architecture and visual art and urban design. So which is why it intersects with Janelle's work quite a bit. Uh, you know, interestingly, I started a forum many years ago in Charlotte and that started my uh, whole engagement in Charlotte. And what we tried to do at the forum, which, which again, we are trying to revive now is that uh, we are having artists not just talk about their work, but you know, uh, about the thinking behind the work, about how the, uh, where the work comes from, how you, how you reach there, exactly the kind of things we were talking about right now. So uh, we find that once you do that, people are able to transcend their their own mediums, because normally a dancer would be discussing the dance uh, with, with other dancers or visual artists would be doing with other visual artists. So we've been able to kind of transcend those divides and, uh, you know, connect across the across different mediums, which is, I think, what uh, years later allowed us to do something hugely multidisciplinary like boom. So in a way we are kind of going back to our roots uh, and uh, we would also love to hear your thoughts on how we can build on this, uh, thoughts on this forum itself and then how we can build and evolve on this. And you know, uh, there is so much of ins insane amounts of talent we can draw on from just the boom artist. But I also know that you know, among the 50 plus people in here, there's even more of that. So if you would want to be part of something like this, you know, any, any ideas like that, you know, this is just the beginning. So we are open to all ideas. So let us know. All right. Uh, Cameron, I don't know how it, exactly this is going to work with all five of us, or do you just go to a, a speaker view or gallery view? What do you do? Uh, I recommend that you, uh, as audience, go make sure you're on speaker view. And then whoever's talking, I'm going to um, unspotlight uh, Janelle. And then whoever speaks, um, they will become, you'll be able to see them in the screen. Um, to keep that from being too confusing, I'm only going to unmute the um, artists and Minoj. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, I noticed that a lot of the chat is from the same group of people. So if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, a little um, bar should populate and there's a chat option right next to share. And if you click on that, that'll allow you to engage in the chat um, and ask questions of the artist, which we would love for you to do. So uh, just to make sure it's working, uh, I can, I'm still seeing Janelle. Uh, is it supposed to switch to me? Um, I guess I need to keep talking to <laughs> make sure uh, that happens. So. Uh, uh, Trey McGriff has a name for you. Janelle is Artivist. A R T I V I S T. No. <laughs> uh, I, I've been called that before too. So, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Trey. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Cameron, it's still spotlighting Janelle. Uh, so, as far as I can see. It's not, you just can't see yourself. Oh, oh, okay. So if I'm talking, I cannot see myself, but everyone else can. Right. Okay, perfect. So just to make sure, uh, Sarah, do you want to say hello or something? Uh, no, you need to say something. Oh. <laughs> it's operated by the voice. Um, well, I uh, it was very interesting to hear about Janelle's process. And um, I actually have a, follow-up question. I'm curious, at first it was really interesting to think about how um, the different layers of meeting within Capoeira and how this kind of has lots of different facets. Um, and I wanted to hear more about how you, you um, envision 
I, the word using dance, and that's not quite the right word that I'm looking for, but including dance or how, how the dance aspect of your new project. I'd just like to hear more about how that will look or what you envision there. I think you're still muted. <laughs> and I'm sorry, what was your answer? Or what do you say? Okay, I'm I'm, I'm unmuted. Oh, um, okay. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, I thought about um, you know I, I guess the way that we use public space as in the act of protest, um, and I wonder. I am still wondering like what are the gray lines? I'm always trying to well always trying to find what are the gray lines? Where are the legal loopholes that can allow me to take up public space? Um, and for me, performance art was that. Or is that? Um, so I, I thought of how could the expression of a protester be exhibited through art? And for me, it just immediately dawned. I was like, okay, it's modern dance. Right, the body. Uh, that's the best yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting that, you know, even though, like I said, Jen and Elena had so many conversations, I, I never knew your, you know, engagement in art and true art started with dance. So, uh, you know, it is kind of more of a link between Sarah and Janelle than I thought. So, you know, because uh, we yeah, can also yeah. working with Reba, which has been awesome. So yeah. another link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were both. Um, I, I, I guess uh, utilizing Reba's like stiff yeah. skills um, yeah. to to do this, but um, also I guess I wanted to connect the the links between um, public space. And oh my gosh, it just it just left me and just left my mind. Like place uh, making or no? No, no, no. It's it's just maybe I mentioned this before, but um, yeah, there are just different ways of activating public space. Um, and for me, contemporary work. Oh yes, Capoeira. This is what I wanted to refer back to what you were saying, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, Capoeira was typically performed in public spaces as well. Um, and it was seen as an act of protest to do capoeira in these public spaces. So there are different rhythms to tell you when the police are coming or oh, when wow. you have to make it look like dance versus when you, get, you are free to express yourself through fight. That's interesting. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So th there are a lot of parallels that even subconsciously influence um, yeah. my, the work that I create because of the practice that I have in my personal life as a capitalista. Yeah. yeah. So Breeze, Breeze, just to call on you and make sure, uh, make sure it's working. Do you have any thoughts or comments on uh, on uh, Sarah's uh, and Janelle's, and and also the other way around too? So I think it'll be, you know, uh, it might, I just think it'll be interesting for all of you to talk about what you related to, what you see seen there, uh, and then we'll go into the more general questions. I think you might, Cameron, you might need to un unmute Breeze. Yeah. Oh, okay. You're on. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. The depth in, with, in which uh, Nell was gone, like, that's a movie. <laughs> that's a movie. That's a reenactment movie movie of what's going on, you know, in another place and how it affects or how somebody cares enough to make it their business to be able to portray through their art. Like that's a movie. Like yikes. <laughs> like that's wow, that sounds like a lot of work, but thank you. <laughs> I mean, you say that, right? But don't you have like a whole visual art? and physical art as far as the dancing is incorporated with being able to express and all of it came from the idea of what's going on in that and oh you know what was it it was china right well it was china well, it was actually it was the 2016 charlotte uprising first and then when i learned of, china, of hong kong's protest mm. Um, that's when I was able to like kind of put the two together. They've actually done a lot of beautiful public displays of uh, of uh, revolution and resistance in order to conceal their identity. So, um, yeah. so what now? A lot of what? A lot of work? 
but you yeah, they've done a lot of work in Hong Kong. Choreograph, <laughs> choreography, and a whole visual, a lot of work. It ain't that much more work. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying it's is you want me to do work, a documentary? Work real hard on that. <laughs> like you work real hard on that. So like I'm just saying, like that's my only point is that that's that's amazing, and that's I can see that as so much as a lot. It's so big like so big and so necessary. So that's 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 all I was saying. That was Thank my you, But um Sam, um I just love dance anyway. My first love was dance. Wow. So yeah, I um I, I my first love was dance. Like I don't know if I can still do it, but <laughs> I don't know if I can still do it. But um yeah, just the expressive the expressive art of dance. Like right now I uh I crump. It's a it's a form of dance called crumping and and um, it's all about being able to be expressive without necessarily I don't know it's it's just different you have to see it I don't really know how to explain it <laughs> but um, the whole every part of every movement is a story or a part of a story and so just being able to even especially. What I seen mentioned in the chat was uh, facial expressions. When you looked into the camera, I was like, yo, why is she snatching my soul like this? <laughs> what I signed up for. Is Sam on this? Is she yeah. muted? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I, I appreciated everyone's art. That was dope. You, you know what I would really love to see? The three of you collaborating on a piece for Boom 2021. Do it, I'm in. Got you. I got you. <laughs> uh, you know, this is you promise? <laughs> I'm I'm all I'm all I'm with all the smoke. I'm with all the smoke. I want it. Let's get it. So you know, we'll open up a, a, a bit to uh, all questions now uh, for any of the artists, or you know, for all of them, or you know, whichever way where you want to do this. Uh, so kind of, you know, while, while that's happening, uh, I think some questions are starting to come in, but uh, so, you know, the, you, you talked about, uh, Janelle, you talked about the, you know, art happening in public spaces, which, you know, interestingly, it's kind of one of the motivations behind Boom too. So, you know, as, as you know, like maybe more than two thirds of Boom happens in open public spaces. You know? So in a way, it's the idea is that art is no longer something you have to go into a very really exclusive space, often a private space to enjoy. It just yeah. happens in, you know, your day, uh, spaces of your day-to-day -day activity. Uh, and in, in a lot of ways, and I, I, you know, starting with that idea, we have been very uh, grateful about how the arts community has responded, but because most artists seem to just get it, you know, uh, even though it's challenging maybe to do a dance piece on a concrete surface or, you know, or, or outside, you know, on the grass, but, you know, it's still, we've been having so much of, so much of response from the arts community. So it, uh, it feels like that's a shift along with you know, social practice that's been happening. Um, so Janelle or anyone else, you, if you have any thoughts on that. It's definitely something that I feel um, more and more interested in. In fact, I feel like not interested in being in a proscenium theater anymore. Like that just, you know, the separation of that seems so uh, huge, you know, and I, I, right. I just really am excited and interested to um, explore other kinds of spaces. This, this piece I'm working on now uh, called The Shift Project, it's a collaborative, collaborative project with a group of dancers, Sam is one of them, Reba, Anna Edwards, and um, D'Angelo Dia, a poet, he's writing um, some things in response to the same theme. Um, and the concept is really like, how does context affect perceived meaning? And so as we create the choreography, I want to insert it in lots of different um, so, uh, public spaces and sort of in lots of different places and sort of make observations about how the meaning and experience changes based on the context of the work. So that's a, our sort yeah. of guiding question of the new, our new piece. So, you know, it, the interesting thing is that uh, most of the work you shared, uh, it is not created for a traditional 
art space, whether it's a museum or, you know, or a big performing arts center, uh, even though like a lot of stuff can happen there, but it doesn't need that. So I wonder what that even uh, says about the future of th that kind of traditional organizations when artists are no longer dependent or, you know, or sometimes you would care about or create for that kind of spaces. So I'd love to uh, get your thoughts on that. Is that for me? Yeah. Well, yeah, for, oh. uh, for all of you. <laughs> I didn't hear. Well, one thing just, uh, I, and Cameron might even want to speak to this, but in Charlotte, there's very, there's not that many spaces for True. dance. Right. And so it's almost a forcing function of how are we going to get the work out? We're going to re-envision where it can be and how it can be seen and how it can be interacted with. Um, so that there is, that's a real issue in the Charlotte dance community, just not, there are not a lot of places to um, have like traditional types of performance. Right. Uh, well, you know, again, one of the reasons for a starting move too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so much of new talent are coming to town. We haven't been able to uh, create platforms for or support a lot of artists. So uh, uh, let me see if there are uh, questions. You just scroll back. Uh, and well, I guess Manoj, I guess this would also be a great time to um, respond because I do know Trey. Um, he is a art art teacher that I I've, I've met years ago, but I I try to steer away from the phrase activist. Um, uh, artivist. Yeah. I, well, you know, just the merge of it. I mean, even right. when I first started, I I labeled myself a social justice creative, and it wasn't until probably 2018. Um, that I recognize that there, hey, that, you know, there are different labels for people who want to identify social issues within their work, and that's how I found social practice artists. But um, I, and, and the reason why I shy away from that is not because I'm not afraid of, it's not because I'm afraid of the work, I'm afraid of what the label does to the art. So if I attach the, um, the label of activist on my art, um, does that somehow infringe on my civil liberties to express? Uh, because there are always, you know, again, legal loopholes and identify or marking identifiers that seek to uh, take away people's rights and, and, and freedom to express. Uh, so that's why I feel much more comfortable in working in the realm of an artist versus an activist, because activism is really serious and sometimes even dangerous work. Um, and if I'm not willing to commit myself to that fully, I'd rather not take on the title. Right. Uh, so, a question from Cameron. Uh, Reese mentioned starting his work from a concept. I'm interested in all of your process and how they differ. It's an open question for all three of you. Hope you heard the uh, question. If not, it's uh, Breeze mentioned starting his work from a concept. I am interested in all of your processes and how they differ. So, uh, do you want to start, Sarah? It looks like Sarah has been muted or? Okay, now I'm not. <laughs> And the weird thing is, if you mute yourself, then the host needs to come back. Oh, and sorry. That's just kind of a weird thing. Yeah. Um, I think that um, in the, much much of my past work has really started from a concept uh, or some sort of um, um, an idea or you know um, a concern. But I really, and I think that that's a valid way of making work. Um, but I'm very interested in trying to start from um, having some questions and going into the studio and really um, moving and starting from movement and then what is the movement saying or how does the you know um, just let like kind of creating a space to listen and to start from a uh, less of a conceptual place and more of a body place and then move uh, forward into a conceptual place, possibly, if that's how the work develops. So um, I think I've probably done both things, but that's definitely where my interest, artistic interest is moving. Janelle, you want to jump in and then, you know, I would love to hear from Reese at the end of it too. Uh, uh, concept, the whole idea of working from a concept? 
Yeah, you know, I mean, or, you know, what, what, like, you know, Bree said, you know, he needs to have an idea and a concept for, you know, for him to, that, that's where he starts. Uh, so the question is, you know, how, how does, does that resonate with you? How is, how is your process different or the same? Well, the process starts with writing um, and it kind of flu fluidly comes that way. I don't force the concept. Uh, to emerge, I just allow it to it reveal itself naturally. Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, and I think as just as like reflected in um, Breeze's work, my work is also cathartic. Like it's a way of like me finally dealing with experiences that have been hard for me to recognize um in the present so this is why i oftentimes see reference afrofuturism in my work not necessarily in this project but i have to have some kind of hope of presence and potential in the future um and it's i guess the concept of what i want to see in the future is what inspires the work sometimes so i, I guess i'll refer to manifest future uh, which is a mural which is like kind of blocked off right now because they're building the uh the trolley lines on um, where Biddy's Ford Road becomes West Trade Street, uh, but it's right behind the old B. Uh, gosh, it's a it's an old grocery store. The grocery store across right from across the Mos Mosaic, Mosaic, Mosaic yeah. Village. Yeah. The Mosaic Village, yeah. Um, but yeah, the concepts typically emerge out of I guess what would be my core, and and that would be trying to figure out how do I honor legacy? How do I honor legacy? of in space and time and uh, culture. Uh, I think, uh, Cameron, you need to, I think you need to unmute Breeze again. It's kind of annoying. But... Okay, Breeze, uh, you're back on. Uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, just wanted to get your observations or you know, kind of going back to the process idea. Going back to the process idea. Um, well, I think very, very differently than, well, I'd like to say, I guess, I, the, based on the people I be around, conversations I have, I think weird. <laughs> I get, I pull, I pull ideas out of things that people wouldn't uh, initially think about. So I'll, you know, the idea or the process of looking at, you know, I don't know if I wanted to keep a, an example simple, the idea or process of looking at a butterfly and your first thought is, where is the hurricane happening? Huh. You know I mean, because the idea is that, you know, a flap of a butterfly wing can start a hurricane somewhere. You know what I mean? Right. So my initial thought is like yo where's the hurricane you know what i mean so like being able thinking like that um just being able to pull from life i don't i don't know i don't care if it's a if it's a tv show if it's a something somebody said during a conversation i have this service um it's a personal slam coaching service i do called the dojo and a lot I give, you know, prompts, I edit work and stuff like that. And when I'm talking to a client and we're initially creating like a prompt to write a new poem, they don't know that that's what's happening. But I just ask them, how was your day? And they'll be, and they'll just start talking. Yeah, I was doing this. And then I started doing that. And then I was like, you know, this, this, that, and the third. And I thought, yo, that happened. So this happened. And, da, 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 and I'll stop them. You know that that's the poem we're writing right there. And they'd be like, how did you do that? <laughs> how did you pull a poem out of that thought? Well, I mean, I don't know. I just and then I explain what the poem is or what the what the idea is that they're thinking about. Like, so my process starts with inspiration from life happening that I pull like a crazy idea from. And then I just start work, getting to work on writing the feelings out, getting the feeling, fleshing the feelings out on paper in front of me and then finding like a concept to creatively um, express them or drive that point home. Um, yeah. I, uh, 
like I said earlier, I, I've gotten used to the idea of the quote unquote concept or how I would present such an idea um, to the point where it's kind of hard for me to proceed without a concept now. So I, I, I feel like, um, I feel like in a lot of cases, writing just to write or just to get this out is cool. I just respect the craft of it also in a sense that now um, once I get this truth out, once I get this point out, once I get this message out, all right, cool, that's done. We good. We right. got it out. If we just need to say this to anybody, then we just say this to somebody. But also, if you're going to present this work, these people don't know you. These audiences don't know you. They don't necessarily have the responsibility of giving you their attention. Right. So how do you keep it? So, you know, how do you earn their attention. How do you say something in a way that they was probably thinking in their mind, but they never would have said it like that? So that really segues into one of the questions uh, from Cameron. Uh, and it's for all of you, uh, kind of a big question. Uh, what relationship are you seeking with audiences? How much of your story are you hoping to get across? Or do you leave space for audience to interpret the work? I'm definitely looking to influence the perspective of the audience. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure, like I, I try not to be as uh, one-sided um, I, I definitely want to meet people in the middle, but I'm meeting people in the middle with the very intention of bringing them closer to my side. Right. Uh, Sarah, if you have any. Oh, I but, uh, Sam, I know you're there. I'd love to, you know, j please jump yeah. in. I'm not calling on you, but I'd really love to hear your thoughts on anything. Sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Um, yeah, I would love to hear Sam's answer also. <laughs> um, just all of so give me my thoughts really quick and maybe we can speak with her. Um, for me, I, uh, I think that I'm really open to, I enjoy to leave that space for interpretation. I think with modern, you know, contemporary modern dance is a very abstract form um, or can be. Uh, and um, yeah, so I think I definitely am interested in I'm bringing forth images and emotion, um, but leaving space for interpretation and experience. And I think there's just something also in the fact that the bodies that are watching, the bodies on stage are resonating with the, the meaning, um, just even on, on a level deeper than an intellectual level. And so I'm interested in that exchange as well. It's not always a, a intellectual narr linear narrative understanding, it's not a deeper type of understanding, a more visceral understanding. Um, and so I'm interested in that. And I think another thing that is um, uh, of value to me is that the dancers and I try to be deeply in the present moment when dancing and when creating dance. And I'm hoping to invite uh, audiences into that same space of presence. Um, because I think also we're so distractible and being in a time when we hopefully can be together in the same room again, watching live performance. That's a unique experience these days, I think. And being in the present moment together, um, yeah, it, is, it, is it important to me. Um, wonder, Sam, yes, do you want to? Yes, yeah, Sam, do you have any? And, and so I know we are right now. looks like. Oh, OK. okay. Uh, Camry, make sure you unmute Sam. So I know we are running out of time. So uh, we are going to end with a question from uh, Trey. But you know, but Sam, go ahead. Yeah, not not to put you on a spot spotlight. <laughs> oh no, sure. Um, yeah, I actually agree with the last thing Sarah said. I was going to say the same thing. Um, I feel the most present when I'm dancing, and I think one of the things that um, I love most about dance is the people is that they're also experiencing that same moment with us in that same time and if they didn't get to experience that they might have never um had those thoughts so when i'm you know dancing or thinking about choreography um yeah i don't i'm not necessarily thinking of a storyline or the pieces that do um it's more it's just what are we both collectively experiencing in this present moment 
So uh, the last question is, and, and I know we have more questions, but you know, given how late it is on a Saturday night, we don't want to keep all of you for much longer. Uh, one of the things we would love to hear from you about is uh, how, uh, uh, you guys can hear me, right? Okay. Uh, how, uh, you know, what would be a good time for this kind of thing, you know, hoping that we can continue this. We, we have, that's one of the things we debated a lot. We thought about doing it on a Sunday afternoon or Friday evening. Uh, since we are doing the big showcase uh, today, we just thought it made sense to uh, do it as a, towards the end of it. So, uh, uh, Trey, I see you. Uh, by the way, uh, good thing about my brother Trey. So he's the founder of Cine Odyssey, an amazing art festival, uh, film festival featuring uh, filmmakers of color from all around the world. Uh, one of the things you guys might not know is that we are very excited. We were very excited to have add a whole new component to Boom uh, called Boom Film, and which is a collaboration between uh, Oliver Crooms, who I think is online, who's with us, uh, Trey McGriff and uh, Julie. Gosh, uh, I should I should know her name, but uh, the yeah, I should have looked it up, but I apologize. But uh, and interestingly, that showcase was, so it was supposed to be like a micro festival drawing from all their festivals. It was supposed to happen today, but hopefully, you know, we'll all come back together and they can be uh, back on there. So in the meantime, check out CD Odyssey and Trey, if you want to just put that uh, on the chat so that people can check it out and also. Uh, all right, so on to Trey's question. Um, and I think it's a perfect one to end on. So this is for the whole panel. What are your feelings on the state of art in Charlotte? Um, I, I'd say it's still growing, it's still maturing. Um, for me, like it doesn't matter what this, okay, it does matter what the state of art is in Charlotte because the arts do need to, they, they, they need support. Um, they, they need room to, to grow and evolve. Um, but I don't know, I, I'm just finding a lot of, um, I'm finding a, a lot of great spaces in like adopting a larger city, Chicago, and then allowing Chicago to be my classroom and bringing the ideas and things that I'm inspired with back to Charlotte. So, whereas, you know, I know a lot of people might have, um, have a different relationship with Charlotte when it comes to the art, and maybe they feel more dependent on it to provide for them. I'm I'm finding a lot more freedom and like in experimenting here, and then learning from like another space. And I mean the state of art in Charlotte, I I know it's growing, it's still developing because Charlotte is still growing and it's still developing. So, uh, um, I guess I have patience, and I. I'm, I'm going to continue to, to really try to disrupt what those institutional spaces look like and disrupt is basically, I, I mean, bringing people in these institutional spaces that typically would not have the opportunity to be in those spaces and both the institution and the people need that. Right. Reese, do you want to go next? Uh, I know that, you know, which a lot of people don't realize is how big, a, uh, big Charlotte is in the spoken word scene internationally. Um, yeah, it's great. It's 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 funny that you say that because that is kind of what um, I was going to make a statement towards. Um, I just feel like there needs to be an emphasis on getting the recognition of these artists. Like what Janelle's doing should not not be known about. You know what I mean? Like. It shouldn't like the people, the artists who are on here who are doing these things should have at least a citywide recognition towards it. Charlotte is literally like as far as a, a accomplishments, accomplishing something. Charlotte Slam team has won the National Poetry Slam the more, more than any other country, right. any other team in the country. Yeah. So like Amazing. think of any city, any city could really have like two or three teams to a city. Think of how many cities in a state, think of states. Now think that Charlotte has won it more than anybody. Why doesn't Charlotte know that? 
That's that's the Charlotte just took each of the team members to the individual world poetry slam in San Diego not long ago. Um November, October, something like that, uh last year. Um of five, I get I would say, yeah, of five people from Charlotte, the Charlotte slam team, this art, this art of spoken word, this poetry. Okay, cool. One of them came in the top 20 out of almost 100 poets. One of them came in top 20. One of them came in 12th. The other one came in 11th. And two of them won. Charlotte has two of the number one poets in the world. Why doesn't Charlotte know that? Right. That's, I, I just believe that when it comes to us, the state of art, or the state, the state of art, the state of, of, okay, I'm thinking too much. <laughs> state of art <laughs> in, uh, in any place, honestly, that the acknowledgements and accomplishments when they're achieved need to just be as present as everything else, anything else. There's no reason why news doesn't know this, why the news wouldn't yeah. make a little segment, just a small little, hey, congratulations to Charlotte, you know what I mean, for right. doing this thing. And anybody doing anything, you know what I mean? I, I mean, I don't know if I'm like reaching too far, you know what I mean, or if I'm- No, I think, I think too, yeah. No, you're right on. I mean, I think, you know, I think the media is very much, very much part of the structural issues that, artist space here. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Sarah, Sam. Sam, do you wanna talk about that? Um, yeah, I think it's growing, but um, I think everybody here and Boom and all the stuff that we all are doing is what's gonna help it keep growing, yeah. I think dance also has a really, I think specifically modern dance, contemporary dance, um, we need more resources, we need spaces, we need spaces to create work, we need spaces to perform work. I mean, so I think there are some real like physical limitations that um, keep an affordable, I mean, there's like a handful of affordable spaces for rehearsing. And I just um, would love to see, you know, residency programs that were focused on dance and, and creating work uh, that way. So um, I, see a lot of exciting things happening in Charlotte and most of it in other artistic mediums, um, the visual arts, and, and I'm excited to learn even more about um, poetry in Charlotte, and, uh, but I think dance um, really could use some resources. <laughs> I mean, that's the honest, honest. <laughs> yeah, but, but we have people, you know, Manoj and, and the rest of Boom, I mean, absolutely are creating opportunities that we, yeah, I'd love to see that grow. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, again, it's, it's a response from the arts community, which reminds us that we are doing the right thing. And, you know, and we have a response we ourselves cannot keep up with. So that also shows what kind of demand we have, what kind of amount of talent we have. So uh, I'm gonna, you know, I think we need to wrap up now. Thank, thank you all. Uh, thanks all of you, all the artists. You know, it's so, such a, you know, kind of letting us in, you know, into your, into your process, into your, uh, into you know, your own uh, personal interests and you know, into your own personalities in a way. Uh, again, a reminder to everyone: this is how you could support Boom as well as the three artists you mentioned. Um, Oh, by the way, just one quick note. Uh, my, I, I couldn't remember the third uh, name of the third person uh, who was doing boom, boom film along with uh, all work rooms at Trey McGriff. It's Julie Emmons. So uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, well, th thanks again to all of you. Thanks again to our awesome team uh, who pulled it all together, uh, Cameron, Jessica, Kia, uh, you know, just wonderful too see it all ha happen in a few days. Uh, going back to the idea of, you know, the, uh, the situation of, or the state of the arts in Charlotte, uh, given that we, we are living through a, you know, really strange time, this was our first experiment to do something about it. Uh, and, 
it just have, I think it worked out well that you know, it's also the weekend when MOVE is supposed to happen, but we hope to continue this. So let us know what we can do. Uh, you know, what we have found out is that uh, we are not, you know, we don't want to be held back by the idea that we don't have any money, we don't have any, any other resources, but just by coming together, just by a lot of very creative people coming together, we can make a lot of things happen. You know, MOVE is, I think the largest ever gathering of creative people which has ever happened in Charlotte, uh, definitely the most diverse one ever. So uh, we are already able to do that. So uh, share your thoughts on uh, what more we could do, especially in the coming weeks uh, before things kind of hopefully go back to how it was before. So I'm gonna end it there, uh, unless there are any other final thoughts or comments from any of you guys. This is Cameron. Thanks so much for coming. I'm going to um, uh, give you all the opportunity to unmute yourselves if you would like and say goodbye or ask an artist a quick question on your way out. Um, and we'll just, I'll, I'll leave the um, meeting open for about another five minutes. Um, so thanks so much for coming and stay tuned. We'll do more things. Mm -hmm.